Susan Marshall and I wish to explore ambient factors that contribute to successful consultations in a writing center. While she focuses on considerations related to the physical environment, I look at issues surrounding the emotional tone of the interactions. Because both of these factors permeate the experience of working in a writing center, they are key to creating a setting that can enhance our effectiveness as consultants. The emotional and relational disposition that I advocate in this presentation is validation. I discuss past strategies of setting an emotional tone in education, how validation differs from those ideas, what counts as validation, why validation matters, and how we know that it is effective. Let's begin with a brief overview of two common emotional tones and relational strategies in educational settings. I will guess that the pedagogies represented here are familiar. As educators, we can be placed in the position of being expected to choose between interacting with students through stern punishment or empty praise. The pendulum has swung between these two extremes, but has not landed on solid middle ground yet. Education in the U.S. has a history of using stern punishment to teach. Our educational system is modeled on the Prussian system of preparing students for military service, in which they must follow orders and function well under threat. A classroom governed by someone exercising stern punishment can accomplish these aims. Many of us have experienced criticism in school that is excessive, unwarranted, painful, and stultifying. While children who grow up in an educational system of stern punishment may learn basic skills, like how to spell words and punctuate sentences, they often also learn to fear nonconformity, creativity, and self-expression. Pe many people who are educated through stern punishment emerge feeling disempowered in the world. This model emphasizes the primacy of authority of the authority figure to the near negation of everyone else. It teaches that students' ideas, solutions, and contributions are less important than their obedience. Many teachers who value thinking outside the box vow not to discount their students or their students' ideas. Instead, they introduce an educational model that is intended, intended to foster confidence. It consists of constantly praising student work regardless of whether the work shows promise. They encourage creativity and self-expression and avoid wielding authority. The desired learning outcomes are to foster egalitarianism and self-expression. However, while this approach can encourage students to speak up, it does not emphasize basic academic competencies or respect for experts in their fields. Many students of this style of schooling lack a sense of their strengths and weaknesses because they have been deprived of honest feedback and assessment. Some develop the attitude that all of their efforts are noteworthy. Often the recipients of an education of empty praise are unable to recognize the merit or deficiency in either their work or that of others. Neither of these models is adequate to education, but what is the alternative? How do we promote respect, confidence, creativity, perspective, and talent without being overly critical or overly praiseful? Is it possible to envision a teaching learning environment that is centered on neither the demands of the teacher nor the feelings of the student? What are the goals that we wish to encourage in educational environments, including writing centers? Answering these questions will provide the focus for the remainder of this presentation. To consider the sort of environment that is suited to today's educational needs, let's return to yesterday's discussion of Aristotelian virtue. Aristotle uses the concept of the golden mean to determine what constitutes a virtue. He claims that a virtue inhabits the balance point between two vices, an extreme of deficit and an extreme of excess. A classic example is that the virtue of courage balances at the golden mean between the vice of excess, which is foolhardiness, and the vice of deficit, which is cowardice. Can Aristotle's technique work for us? Can we discover a virtuous educational approach that lies between the excesses of harsh punishment and empty praise? Is there a relational model that allows a balance between the teacher and the student without diminishing either the teacher's knowledge or the student's creativity? I propose that the approach we need is that of validation. It provides a third way that is neither severe nor vacuous. 
Validation involves recognizing another and giving him or her permission to be authentic. Validating someone requires seeing both the person and the situation as they are with permission for them both to be as they are while maintaining confidence that the person is capable of navigating the situation successfully. Because validation offers acknowledgement of who one is, where one is, and where one is headed, it is kind and sincere. In order to validate others, one must be willing to be present with them and one must know how to validate oneself. Validation is both a disposition and a skill. In order to understand the importance of validation, we must clarify our aims as educators and writing consultants. Because academic content in all fields changes rapidly, we must teach not only current understandings, but also skills that will continue to grow in order to enable people to keep pace with ongoing new knowledge. We need to teach how to engage with the world productively and creatively. Which skills are needed? Some of the best skills, then, are those that continue to develop, like clarity of thought and communication, perseverance, confidence, creativity, empathy, and the abilities to synthesize and integrate information, see implications, and remain involved. Validating people helps them to see their strengths, appreciate their weaknesses, hone their thinking, improve their communication, persevere, and stay engaged. Sir Ken Robinson challenges us to teach the whole person. He reminds us that intelligence is not compartmentalized. As writing consultants, we have an opportunity to support the skills that people need for lifelong learning. When a person brings a piece of writing into the writing center in order to receive feedback, there are three factors at play, the consultant, the writer, and the essay. Each feature of the consultation is distinct and contributes something different Hopefully, our interactions demonstrate that students, consultants, and competencies are all valuable. While the consultant allows the writer to express how she or he would like to be supported, the writer is grateful for the talents and time offered by the consultant. Their interaction, then, is structured around their needs as well as the needs of the paper. Ultimately, the writer and consultant discuss their common goal of improving the writing process based on the input provided by each element, the demands of the paper, the requests of the writer, and the suggestions of the consultant. In this way, the cooperative purpose of the session takes center stage. It requires honest discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of the writing. We measure validation in the writing center by the ability of participants to be authentically engaged and present with both one another and the task at hand. Although showing up emotionally to meet writers fully requires energy and attention, it is also energizing. Ironically, validation can dissipate any overwhelm that educators may experience. And approaching writers through validation leads to better sessions. Why? Because validation builds trust, allows people to be surprising, and opens up choices. What does it mean exactly to relate to others through validation? Which interactions are validating? Here are some ideas. We can reflect to others what we hear them communicating. We can inquire about their experiences. We can ask them where they plan to go from here. We can ask them what we can do to help and let them decide what counts as helpful. And we can suggest some ways that we might address the situation. Let's consider an example. A writer shows up with a draft of a five-paragraph compare-contrast essay on an article from class. The composition is uninspired. Consultants committed to validation know that a bad paper does not imply a bad person, just as a good paper does not imply a good person. Part of the issue in this scenario, and hence part of the answer, seems to be related to motivation. It's okay to say, it seems that you are not too excited about this assignment. A follow-up inquiry may be, why is this assignment important to you? When the writer discovers the personal importance of the essay, even if it rests solely on being able to express oneself more clearly or doing well in a class to complete his or her degree, then the essay becomes about more than completing an assignment. One way to validate the importance of the writer, then, is to create a link between the writer's own goals and the writing. The motivation comes from answering why, not what. 
Note that in this example, our focus is on the writer and the process, trusting that it is through the person and the process that the product is refined. Let's consider what's necessary for learning and writing to occur. Learning by definition involves being able to look at situations in an alternative light and incorporate new information into a worldview. The process of learning requires us to acknowledge that we don't know everything. In a system of either harsh punishment or empty praise, not knowing something is uncomfortable. Vulnerability is not good. Either we are marked down or ridiculed, or we are told that we are great anyway, which we suspect is not true. Writing requires the same sort of openness as does learning. At the same time that a writer must be vulnerable, she or he must also be confident enough to ta tackle the subject. If one doesn't know anything, then one has nothing to say. If one knows everything, then writing doesn't offer any enjoyment or challenge. Hence, writers must be confident, but not closed, and vulnerable, but not afraid. Writing, then, like learning, rests on the tense relationship between knowing something and being willing to explore it further. In a reflective feedback group, we reviewed memorable consultations with writers. One theme was the importance of the exchange that occurs before we discuss the writing. When a, writer, when a writer is, quote, having trouble with an essay, that trouble can take many forms. Often the writer has come to the center because she or he is experiencing some sort of block. It may have to do with school issues, such as being angry with an instructor, frustrated with school, confused about the assignment, or unmotivated academically, or it may relate to personal issues, such as being heartbroken, homeless, in a new job, unstable financially, or worried about the future. Processing these sorts of blocks is one aspect of improving writing. Notice in these circumstances, the strengths and weaknesses often go together. The anger with the instructor and frustration with school arise from wanting to learn, but not yet grasping the subject. The confusion emerges out of a willingness to be vulnerable. The lack of motivation betrays a desire for purpose. The heartbreak demonstrates care for others. The financial and life instabilities indicate a resiliency to persevere despite hard circumstances, and a fear of the future comes from a desire for success. Rather than feeling daunted by the challenges that writers face, recognize that the strengths and weaknesses accompany each other not only in our clientele, but also in ourselves. When someone is off point, we can always listen. Sometimes figuring out a way to continue in school is the link that unlocks a great essay. We are left with the issue of whether there is reason to hold that validation improves learning. Sugata Mitra placed computers in areas where people didn't know how to use them, only to discover that children could understand complex information rapidly when given the opportunity. The one factor that Mitra found to increase the rate of learning is what he calls the, quote, grandmother effect. The grandmother effect occurs when one is encouraged and admired by someone who is interested in his or her success. Having someone ask and applaud a learner significantly boosts learning. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? What have you learned? How do you know it's true? Wow, that's fascinating. People acting as, quote, grandmothers need not know anything about the subject matter that they are encouraging in order to accelerate learning. His findings demonstrate the importance and effectiveness of validation. Writing consultants, however, are not simply encouragers, but also experts. We can help to structure the path and the goals, as well as to provide support and inquiry. As consultants, we are uniquely positioned to facilitate great progress. At the end of the day, practicing the skills and disposition of validation in our roles as educators and consultants improves the learning and writing in educational environments, including writing centers. Thank you.